This is my book, Alternate Dad. It's a memoir of my life as a quote-unquote hipster father, um, which wasn't initially going to be uh, how I characterized it, but then um, trends moved in a certain direction, and I decided that it would be nice to be a part of it. So um, it, uh, it goes a little something like this. This is the prologue. I was napping pleasantly on a futon one Saturday afternoon when my wife flung open the door. She held a filthy sponge in her left hand. A look of terrified desperation clouded her eyes. Catastrophe, she said. What, I said. Your son took off his diaper. He's throwing shit all over his bedroom. And he's enjoying himself. That's bad, I said. It's disgusting, that's what it is. Now get out of bed and help me clean. I'd woken up with the kid, who had just turned two, at 6.30 a.m., and I was tired. Plus, allergies had mashed my brains into lentil soup. They call it cedar fever here, which is an insult to cedars, and even to fever. It's horrible. My head was encased in a stack of hay. My eyes had been scraped dry. I needed a nap. No, I deserved a nap. But this situation required a dad. Damn it all to hell, I said. And I got up. Elijah stood in the middle of the living room. He was naked, flapping his arms and hopping around like a Packers fan on Wild Card Sunday. <laughs> ah, ha, ha, he said. Elijah, bad. Regina was in Elijah's room with a roll of paper towels and a bottle of industrial cleaner. She scrubbed the wall next to his bed with unrestrained fury. Elijah had thrown his blankies on the floor. Little chunks of poo corrupted all three of them. He smeared it all over the slats of his crib, Regina said. It's on his stuffed animals. It's everywhere. I really think I'm going to puke. I see carrots. Oh no, there are peas. And corn. This is uh, very highbrow stuff. Uh, there's a similar scene like, uh, like this in uh, Norman Mailer's new Hitler book. <laughs> she wasn't looking at me as she said that. I think she was speaking to some sort of abstract, abstract god of parenting. Then she turned to me with a command. Entertain him, she said. Now. I looked at Elijah, who was cackling and turning in a circle. He didn't need to be entertained. He needed to be pacified, so I turned on the TV. It was that Little Bear program where the Maurice Sendak created animated bears are such a happy family and they always solve life's little problems like getting lost in the woods or attacked by a puma because their lives are based on sincere friendship and good judgment. Oh, how I loathe Little Bear. Thank you for that. Regina emerged from the bedroom and pointed the sponge at me. Threat brewed in her gaze. You need to run him a bath, she said. Right. She returned to the bedroom. I went into the bathroom and turned on the faucet. Elijah ran down the hall. I grabbed him around the waist and twisted him upward. He howled. Don't you dare, I said. Daddy, do, he said. He looked so cute, I just had to tickle him right then. Regina continued her attempts to contain the situation. She ordered me to put bubbles in his bath, even though I always put bubbles in his bath and wouldn't consider doing anything else. But I understood. Sometimes, when matters spiral, you just have to control what you already know. By the time the bathtub was filled, the trauma of the afternoon had already waned. Regina had picked up all of the larger poo chunks. She looked like a field surgeon three days after Antietam. All that remained... All that remained was two loads of laundry. Do you want help, I asked? No, she sighed. Are you sure? Regina was the motor of my ambition, the bulwark of my soul, the apple of my eye, and the pearl of my heart. She handed me an afternoon's worth of our baby son's shit. Just get rid of this, she said. And I took it, because I loved her. I walked outside. The wind nipped. I was wearing a white t-shirt gray boxer briefs, and black socks pulled up to my knees. Also, I was holding a plastic Walgreens bag full of human excrement. A chill gust stopped me for a moment, and I had a premonition. Someday, I realized, I'll look like this all the time. Thanks.
Oh my God. Save your applause for the end, please. <laughs> Apparently, this is being videotaped tonight for um, for my first appearance on YouTube. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. Um, I'm, I'm going to call myself Lonely Dad 36. I love you, but I'm so sad to be trapped in this room by myself. Um, in addition to um, to this being a uh, a memoir of contemporary parenthood, it's also a story about one man's um, lifelong uh, love affair with drugs. And um, it's also about um, my uh, pre, uh, to some extent, although not to any great extent that would annoy people, um, about my pre-parenthood career as uh, the quote-unquote greatest living American writer. Um, I, would tra I traveled around the country and to a small extent the world um, making fun of uh, pompous uh, literary uh, culture and in doing so became part of that culture myself. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to read you uh, about um, my first business trip I took as a father. I was invited by the John Adams Institute of Amsterdam to be the American representative at Dutch National Poetry Day, an annual celebration. Because I had never actually published a poem in English, I was a somewhat odd selection for this honor. In my home country, I generally performed my spoken word poetry parodies in front of a dozen people or fewer in the back rooms of independent bookstores. But in the low countries, several thousand people had witnessed my act in grand opera houses and cavernous, acoustically generous concert halls built to house acts like Oasis and Blur. Oscar, my Dutch publisher, which sounds a lot more glamorous than it really is, I don't know if it sounds glamorous at all, actually, um, but I had one, thought that he might be able to cash in on this situation. Do you have to do this, Regina asked. It would be a great insult to the John Adams Institute if I didn't, I said. We have a three-month-old baby, she said. Don't you care about him at all? Of course I do, I said. I care about him more than anything in the world, but I still want to go to Amsterdam. <laughs> It's a fun opportunity for me. You just want to go to Amsterdam so you can smoke pot, she said. That's not true, I said. She looked at me, arms crossed. Okay, I said. It is true. But that's not the only reason. I felt a little guilty, not so much because I was going, but because I'd be going without her. Though I was going to be gone only four days, and she'd be taking care of the baby by herself. She definitely got the short end of the transaction. For 24 hours in Amsterdam, I was a responsible representative of my country. Oscar had set up some interviews for me with such high-powered outlets as a monthly Jewish newspaper in Rotterdam. <laughs> also, as part of the National Poetry Day celebration, I and the other participants had each been assigned to write a fable and to teach a workshop about fables to a class of high school students. I hadn't written a fable since I was eight years old, and it showed. <laughs> in a couple of hours... I slapped out a lame animal parable about tolerance, based on the recent assassination of Dutch Prime Ministerial candidate Pim Fortuyn, about whom I knew nothing. <laughs> then I taught my class and chose, as the organizers had instructed me to, the best student from the class to give a presentation that evening. My student would compete against the other students from the other classes. If she won, she'd receive a prize. Up until 15 minutes after the lecture ended, I was sober. As I walked out into the late afternoon, I had three hours before I had to present my poetry in a public performance. Now, I decided, would be the perfect time to get high. When is it, though? <laughs> <clears throat> Amsterdam's coffee shops held no mystery for me. I visited many times and knew all the neighborhood spots, not just the uh, places for Australian backpackers. <laughs> Since I basically did nothing else when I was in Amsterdam, I had more or less memorized a stoner's walking tour that would be the envy of the most experienced Cannabis Cup judge. When I next looked at my watch, two hours and fifteen minutes had passed in a magnificent haze of high-octane legal weed and herbal tea. I'd enjoyed conversations with a one-armed Nigerian taxi driver and an anthropology professor from a low-rent Midwestern community college who just emerged from a two-day mushroom trip <laughs> in his hotel room. <laughs> I stepped out onto a major thoroughfare, full of confidence in myself, both as a professional and as a dad. I pulled a picture of Elijah out of my wallet and thought cliches that were still true. I love my son so much. Look at him. He's beautiful. 
Life with him is going to be a wonder. I'm the luckiest man in the world. To my right, I saw one of Amsterdam's many smart shops. These are less famous than the coffee shops, but their wares are more powerful, more obscure, and just as quasi-legal. I walked in, briefly pondered a display of homegrown peyote, bought a packet of some sort, and swallowed two pills with a gulp of water. By the time I arrived at the venue, my lips felt like sausages. Oscar gave me a conspiratorial grin. How are you feeling, he said. I couldn't tell him that at the moment I was imagining that my eyes had popped out of their sockets, shot forward about ten feet attached by thin ligaments, wrapped themselves around my head, and reinserted themselves in new sockets that had opened up just above my eyebrows. <laughs> he wouldn't have understood. So instead I said, oh, fine. I was second on the evening's program. My opening act was Gerd Comridge, the poet laureate of Holland. <laughs> That's right. And as befitting his position and nationality, he was stern, angular, and slightly bemused. He wore mostly black and red and Dutch. This gave me a lot of time to ponder the fact that my legs were slowly melting into the floor. I wondered how I'd make it up to the podium without them, particularly since the rest of me was filling up with oatmeal. <laughs> when the Poet Laureate of Holland cut his reading short because he had a train to catch, the MC introduced me as our, quote, distinguished American visitor. <laughs> a film of dripping sweat plagued my entire body. When I took the podium, I was hot. Good evening, people of the Netherlands, I said. My name is Neil Pollock, and I am the greatest living American writer. <laughs> with that, I lifted a pitcher of water off the podium and dumped it over my head. <laughs> Oscar and his friends seemed to think it was funny even if the rest of the crowd didn't. This gave me encouragement to continue. We were on the eve of the Iraq invasion. As I'd sat there, not listening to the Poet Laureate of Holland, I decided to deliver a monologue of pure patriotic bluster to parody the misguided war fever that was currently gripping the United States. I stand here representing, I said, the greatest country in the history of the world, the beacon of democracy to oppressed people everywhere. Our enemies tremble in the face of our awesome military might and our international system of secret prisons that are accountable to no one. <laughs> our allies feel safe and comfortable under our broad protective wings. All hail the United States of America, where literature kicks big ass. A man in the back of the hall rose, shouted, you will be punished, and stormed out. I later learned that he was the Iraqi representative <laughs> to National Poetry Day. I actually um, then was forced by the John Adams Institute to have an email correspondence with this guy, and um, he just continued to, he just kept uh, accusing me of crimes against humanity, so eventually I just kind of had to cut it short. I just, you know, couldn't explain to him that I kind of agreed with him. Um, the rest of the evening was a mix. My student from the Fable class gave a great presentation and won the prize, but then later on a panel, I compared a German poet to Hitler and accused the moderator of asking, quote, the stupidest questions of all time. <laughs> when someone in the audience asked me what advice I'd give to young people who wanted to be writers, I said, doesn't matter what you say, if you say it loud enough and for long enough, eventually people will pay attention. Well, the moderator said, I'm certain we will now all live our lives according to Mr. Pollock's wise advice. <laughs> Afterward, my prize-winning student came up to me with her parents. Thank you, her father said. You've really inspired my daughter. I have a son, I said. So I understand. Thank you. <laughs>